Hello there, it's Jay here from Jay's Vintage Junk and I've got another project in mind. Um, since the lockdown I've been doing quite a bit of gardening and it's dawned on me that I could really do with a wheelbarrow and I've been having a look on um, places like eBay and like the cheapest, nastiest uh, wheelbarrow that they sell is about 30 quid but I think it was 28 quid the one, uh, the cheapest one that um, B&Q sell and you look on eBay and they come, the, the eBay ones seem to come as like a flat pack and you have to put them together and I had um, one of them type wheelbarrows from B&Q years and years ago and I ended up having to weld every single bolt and joint on it just to stop the thing um, folding it was a piece of crap really the only thing good on it was the galvanised steel um, bed which ended up going on a friend's ancient old um, wheelbarrow that the bed had rotted out on. Um, anyway, so I thought, rather than buy one, seeing I've got plenty of scrap about and plenty of time on my hands, uh, why don't I build one? And build one more to exactly what I want rather than just a wheelbarrow that you buy from you know a DIY store or online which is well designed to be cheap basically it's designed for um, cheapness of manufacture not of um, ease of use so if I, if I design my own wheelbarrow it'll basically be exactly what I want for my purposes I've got specific things in mind like I don't particularly want a wide uh, wheelbarrow I want one that's quite narrow because at some point I want to take like um, garden waste from the front garden through the garage, through the kitchen and the garage into the front to put in my brown bins. Um, which means getting through a standard doorway, it also means getting down the front of my house which currently has two immobile cars on it and not a great deal of um, width between them. So a standard wheelbarrow that I bought from the likes of B&Q wouldn't actually be that much use to me. Yeah, sure, I can use it in the back garden, but if I want to say transport waste from the back garden into the front, then it's not really that much use to me. So, um, I'll just get you down onto a piece of paper and we can uh, have a bit of a scribble. Because I have got a sort of a plan in mind. Um, just bear with me, because it kind of involves <laughs> that. Now that is one of the wheels off of him, if you keep watching my like gardening update type videos. Um, that's, uh, well it's the centre of the front wheel and it's the tyre and inner tube of the back wheel off one of those uh, bikes that got uh, dredged out of our local canal. Um, the rest of that bike really is only fit for the odd little, there's a couple of rare BMX bits on it which I want to salvage because uh, I know they've got a value, I've got, you know, they've got a market for them, they've got some value in them. Um, the rest of the bike was completely shot. This wheel I would never ever consider using actually like on a bike, it wouldn't be safe, but for a wheelbarrow um, I think it'll be absolutely fine. Um, Amazingly, um, that's the original inner tube that was in it, and it actually, this has been up for well over a week now. I took, took this off and did this wheel um, last week. So this has been inflated for a week, and it's still, it's not lost any, um, not lost any air. So, that's going to be my front wheel. I've freed the, I mean, if you listen to the bearings on it, I mean, the wheel's not good. It wouldn't be good on a bike, but for wheelbarrow use, they're perfectly acceptable. So anyway, as a start we've got a um, we've got a front wheel. And I'm going to just zoom me down onto my um, on my bench where I've got my pad and my paper and we can um, I'll just have a quick a quick scribble and we can basically have a look what we're uh, is my camera gonna stay? Come on, stay where I want you to stay. There we go. Right I had a quick look on the web to get some ideas of really what I um, what I wanted to do, and I found this. Now this is probably Victorian Edwardian um, style wheelbarrow. Very very simple. As we can see, we've got a nice big wheel at the front, which is what I've got. It's a 14-inch um, wheel. That I mean, most wheelbarrows have what perhaps. 
10 inch wheel, um, if it's a big one, um, 8 inch wheel, something like that. I've got a big 14 inch wheel. Again, that's something that I really I want because I've got quite a few steps in my um, back. It's sort of tiered my um, back garden from a patio at the top and then it steps down. Um, and then it steps down again into um, a lower part of the um, garden. So having a nice big wheel will help me get up them um, steps quite a bit, you know, quite a bit easier. That's sorry, I'm just finishing my coffee off. Um, that's one of the plus points of um, the night. You're know, having a nice, a nice big front wheel. All this is timber. Now. I'm not intending to go out and buy anything for this project um, at all. I've actually bought in already the one thing uh, that I have actually paid out for this project, and that's um, hopefully. Well, we're going to give the game away, but that's um, a couple of rolls of uh, this is um, flux cord um, 0 0.8 mil um, welding wire. So, essentially what we're going to do is we're going to recreate something not identical to this, but using this as kind of like the inspiration. But instead of timber for the framework, uh, we're going to use um, box section steel. Um, mainly because I've not really got any timber that would be 100% suitable um, for this. And like I say, I want to use just what I've got. I don't want to go out and really get anything, um, get anything for this project. We will use timber for the um, for the box that sits on top. I'm not sure I'm going to go with um, quite as basic a box as that's got, or I'm going to go with something um, a little bit more like um, a, a more traditional wheelbarrow, or somewhere in between. Like I'm not like I'm not 100% sure about the top. That really dictates. Partly on what wood I can find. I've got some um, timber that was left over from some other projects. It's what I've re rejected from other projects, so it's a bit scrappy, but um, it might it might do. Um, right. So, what my intent is is I'm basically going to make a um, a chassis. That the timber work's going to sit on. So what we're going to have, we're going to have two rails. So if we draw, these are going to be about. They're probably going to be a meter long because I've got a couple of two meter lengths of um, box section. And so it's salvage. Everything I'm using in here has had a past life in some way, shape, or form, really. Um, so we're going to have two rails quite close together actually they're not going to be that far apart and they're going to have the wheel carriers I've got some um, angle section some like L section like um, like that kicking about that was part of an old bed uh, so I'm going to make some wheel carriers to go on the end there one that side one that side and the wheel will go obviously in the middle there to the front then we'll put a cross, pe a cross section piece in across there again in the uh, box section steel. I'm planning to have this about 500 mil, the uh, the actual width of it. That means I can get it between my um, two immobile cars on the front drive with ease. I'm not going to risk damaging them um, either of the cars or um, scraping my knuckles or anything. So we'll have it about 500. Well, a lot of wheelbarrows are, are tapered. I'm going to have mine square, more like that. So it's, you know, it's not going to be a, like a wedge shape. It's going to be square, the actual um, box on the back. So we'll have them coming across like that. And then we'll again, we'll have the same at the back. So we'll have a piece that goes across the back there, welded on. So that'll be the basic that'll be the basic um, metal frame. I'll probably do the handles. The handles, again, are where I'm going to differ away from um, this design. This has got the chassis running through to the handles. I'm not going to do it that way. I'm going to um, make the chassis and the handles actually be fitted on part of the um, box up at the top here. 
and I'll probably make them out of, I have got some timber um, I'm planning to make the handles from uh, so they'll probably be about again possibly a metre and a half long I've got two pieces of this timber that um, I plan to use um, it's actually the timber that um, I was going to use for the centre shelf on my um, cabinet there on my um, saw bench that I made but I thought I'd run out of I found two more um, about 1500 mil lengths so they should make the um, struts and the, for the um, handles at the end I'm going to do that slightly different than how it's done on here um, so that's going to be our basic um, our basic frame and in fact what we're going to need is we're going to need, we're going to need a couple of outriggers as well I think it depends how I do the stand. I'm just wondering how I'm going to do the stand. What I might do, yeah, I'll put a bit further in, say there, to um, to what we'll call outriggers. So there'll be one on that side there. There'll be one on that side there, like that. And if we show this in, um, in the other view, so basically we're going to have the wheel center point there then we'll have the wheel carrier there the beam will come on top across like that then where we've got them outriggers we're going to make some pieces that come back oh they'll come to about that that kind of length about the same length as the um, base so when it sits it sits with the base flat so we'll make this out of some more, I've got some thinner, um, smaller, um, I think it's like 12mm by 12mm or something, a very thin uh, box section which I think will make that leg there. So there'll be two legs, one on each side like that. And then obviously we'll have the, um, we'll have the wooden, um, wooden bit on top like that and then the handles will probably come out. I've not decided where the handles are going to come out, basically, because I'm, I'll, I'll weigh that up once I've got that bit built. Whether I want the handles at the top there, whether I want them lower down, whatever feels comfortable for the actual um, barrel. But I won't really know that until I've got the rest of that um, built and I can actually see where I'm going to stand. I mean, I'm six foot one, so I don't want to be stooping every time, um, stooping right down every time I want to get hold of this and move this thing. Converse it, I don't want it so when I stand up, you know, everything's tipping out the front. There's a fine balance where you actually really, um, where you really want it. So I'll do that, like I said, once I've got the, the framework built, we've got the wheel on it and the, that on, we can start looking at perhaps where we want the handles and finalise exactly how we're going to do the woodwork on, um, on top there. Right, let's go through some of the materials I've got to work with. Um, timber wise, for the actual body, for, for basically this bit, or whatever I, my interpretation of um, this bit here, we've got this. Now these, I've shown these before, I've made um, a few things out of these um, over, since I got them. These are all floorboards um, out of a house in um, the village that got used as a cannabis farm and um, caught fire. And um, when it was, you know, it was a um, bit of a mess and um, a hoo-ha over it in the uh, village. And <laughs> eventually the house was being renovated and uh, the builders, the house was basically totally gutted. Uh, it did a lot of damage. They had, apparently they had it in the attic of this building, and um, it caught the whole attic on fire and set fire to the houses next door, and um, it was a mess. Fortunately, no one was injured, no one was hurt in it, but um, it burnt most of the building, um, and they basically completely gutted it. And I, well, I was speaking to the um, builders as they were working, and I saw them throwing all this in um, the skip, and I said, "Oh." Um, would well, you mind if I took that for my fire? And they basically said, um, yeah, help yourself, uh, more of that you take, because the fewer skips we need. So I had, I basically got the entire upper floor of the um, house, and these are they're probably about 200 years old. Um, the house, it's an old stone terrace, and um, they're getting on for about 200 years old, I think. 
but this is, I've, I've got a few little bits of this left, I've used most of it, I mean a lot of it was not in usable condition, it was burnt, I mean, I think it was some, yeah I mean, you, if you look, I mean even some of this has burn on it, um, I'll, well I'm not worried about that for this project, I mean that'll probably go on the bottom or it'll get sanded out and it'll look quite cool actually, um, but I've got a few bits of this left, they're buried right in the bottom of my wood store, so I'm going to have to dig all the rest of the timber out to um, get to them, but I've got some of that left. I've got some, this again came out of a skip, it's the same thickness, it's new. It's slightly newer timber. Um, I've got a few bits of that, the only problem with this is it has got paint on it, so I'll need a fair bit of sanding. So I've got some of that, but like I say I do have a few more Oh, I would prefer to use for things that are visible um, this stuff because like it's lovely and old and it's not much use for anything else now. So I will see if I can dig out the rest of that. Um, other things that I've got for this project, I was lucky enough to find another. I've got another one of these. Um, it does have a bit of grot on it there, but I don't. It's where it's been resting up against another rotted timber, this is actually, you know, really solid. Um, that will probably be out of sight anyway, possibly under, I'll, I'll hide the worst of the grot anyway. Uh, it does probably need a bit of cleaning and denailing and sanding and what have you, but I've got a couple of pieces of that and that's what I'm going to use for my handles. They're going to come out the end and I'll um, form some handles on the end of it. So that's basically the timber um, taken care of. The rest is um, going to be ironwork. Now for the wheel carriers and for some corner angle, oops, careful I don't break my windows, I've got a couple of lengths of this. Again, now this is, this is um, something I've been waiting to do a project with for years and years and years. Um, it's probably 1920s um, angle steel and what this was, was um, this was actually part of my uh, late grandmother's bed um, when we cleared the house back in, Jesus, um, 2008 I think it was, 2007, some, sometime back then. Uh, obviously we had to get rid of all the old furniture in there and the bed was was worthless, there was um, no one wanted the bed, um, even the house clearance people didn't want the bed. So I ended up making things out of it, um, the headboard of it actually ended up as um, a shelf in uh, my rental property, um, in the living room there's a, a big TV nook, uh, well, it'll take like a 42 inch um, LCD TV, it's where the house used to be going off tangent, the house uh, used to be um, a bakery many, many, many years ago. And when I stripped the front room out, we found where the old bakery oven used to be. And I basically turned it into a TV nook. And the shelf in that is actually uh, the headboard of uh, my grandmother's old bed. And these were the um, angle sections that went down the side that made the bed up. And I've kept them far, you know, to build into a project at some point and um, I think this is probably where they're going to, uh, at least a piece of it's going to go into this so um, I'm going to make the wheel carriers because it's a, it's a decent enough um, gauge steel I mean these have been outside for years and they're still in, um, still in perfect condition um, so I'll be cutting a few, few small sections out like that to make the wheel carriers and probably some larger sections out like that to make some um, corner pieces for the front of the um, for the front of the barrier, just to um, reinforce it a little bit. And possibly not. I'm in two minds whether to do that um, that or not. But I'll definitely use that to make my um, wheel carriers. So get that out of the way. And the last steel that I've got, and <laughs> funnily enough. Also, um, also part of an old bed. This is actually part of an old ex-girlfriend's bed that I've uh, again had lying around for um, an awful long time. Um, 
Yeah, well, these are, again, these are the basically a modern equivalent of what I've just shown you. They're uh, the runners from the um, outside of a, um, a bed. And it's nice, solid um, box section steel. The only thing is, at the moment, we've got two pieces of steel joined together here. And we're going to use both pieces, but not in this configuration. So what I'm going to have to do is um, I'm going to have to get the grinding wheel with a very thin cutting disc on it. And if you look here, and here, and here, all the way up, well, I presume they're coming out on the camera, you can see there's some little stitch welds all the way along, like every 200 mil or so, there's um, a little uh, like 10 mil stitch weld. So what I'm going to have to do is run a cutting disc through all them and just cut through them. Again, same on the back side. Um, these are like, like a little bit bigger actually, but the same thing, just further spaced apart, these like 300 mil for, um, apart. Um, same thing, we've got some little stitch welds. So if I whiz my um, cutting disc through them, we can separate them two pieces of steel, and that means we've got that nice, uh, what's that? It's like 30 by 15 or something like that. 30 by 20. It could be 40 by. Um, I've got a tape measure here, we'll just have a quick look. So this is, um, oh it's um, 50, it's um, 50 by 25 box, so that's, that's quite substantial, that's definitely going to make the two uh, main chassis rails, uh, obviously because it was a bed, I've got two of these, and then we've got, oops, that's 20, yeah, we've got some 20 by 20 box as well. Um, I've got some other pieces of this that are left over from another project I made out of this bed that I used the um, the cross pieces, which were all this 20 by 20 box. I've got a load of offcuts of that um, stocked about somewhere. So between them and this, we've got enough um, actual stock steel to make the um, to make the framework. So basically, that's what we're going to be. Um, that's what we're going to be making this thing from is um, all this scrap. Um, so we better have a look at how we're going to um, how we're going to glue all this lot together. Right, let's have a quick look at the tools we're going to use in this project. Because as well as the normal, you know, a drill and um, a saw and what have you, uh, we're also going to obviously be using some other other power tools. So. We'll be using grinders. We'll be basically using two flavours of um, cutting wheel or um, grinding wheel. We've got very thin ones like this, which are great for actually cutting the cutting the steel. And those little welds that I was um, showing, these will um, just slip through them without actually cutting and grinding into the um, steel that we want to keep. So. Basically, we'll be using that one with a really thin cutting wheel. And then we have. Just get this one out. And it's got tangled up with another one. We've got one with a much thicker, if you look at that wheel, that's actually a grinding, a grinding wheel, so. Basically, we'll be using that just to dress the welds up um, once they're in. So we'll be using those two grinders. Well, you, you don't need two grinders. I just do this because it's quicker than keep swapping the um, discs about. I mean, obviously, you only need one. Um, it's a lot easier if you've got one with a, um, a nice thin cutting wheel and one with a grinding wheel because, like I said, obviously, you're not keep um, swapping your... Um, Swapping your grinding discs every um, every few minutes. I also have one here. This is a very old. This is this is literally my first angle grinder that I bought when I was like eighteen. Um, it's not the best angle grinder um, in the world. These were really cheap. I think they were like fifteen quid from the market stall. Um, all this gets used for now is as a um, powered wire wheel. Um, got a wire wheel attachment on it there, and I use it for de-rusting when I'm working on the Land Rover and um, things like that. 
but yeah, that was uh, that was my first um, angle grinder. And put that away, and we'll get on to the um, the stuff you use to glue your metal together. Right, I'll just reset and um, back in a tick. Right, uh, well this is my welding, um, my welding setup, so let's have a quick talk about, um, talk about welders. Um, we'll start on the end here. This is a, um, this is a little um, Sip Merlin um, stick welder or arc welder. This is in fact my first welder I ever bought when I was 18. Um, I needed to replace an outrigger on um, my Land Rover. I had a um, 1966 uh, Series 2A Land Rover as my <laughs> as my first car, and um, one of the outriggers, one of the uh, fuel tank. It was an ex-military one actually with um, twin fuel tanks, and one of the fuel tank outriggers um, rotted out on it and I replaced it using, um, I learned to weld on that Land Rover um, and replaced that outrigger uh, with that arc welder there, that stick welder. Um, stick welding is really much better for thicker material. You can just about get away with it on a Land Rover chassis if you're using quite thin, um, thin electrodes. I might as well go into this a little bit because I, I mean some of you might not really know anything about um, welding and um, stuff like that so uh, it's not what I normally put on my channel but um, this is what I, other things that I do uh, rather than when I'm not messing with electronics. Um, so basic arc welder, what we use, let's see if we've got some in here. It's basically you have electrodes. These are um, electrodes. They come in different thicknesses, different gauges. So, so we've got some uh, reasonably thick ones there that don't really get used because um, I don't weld massively thick steel, really. I mean, I've got them if I um, ever needed to. We've got the thinner ones here, which and so and various ones in between. These are good for um, your, more, your thinner your thinner steel. And when I say thinner, I mean perhaps mil and a half, two mil. Uh, anything under that, you're going to really, really, really struggle to weld with a um, with a stick welder like that, with an arc welder. But, um, like I said, if it's, if it's thicker stuff, um, it's fine. It's, um, it's fairly easy to pick up stick welding. Um, you can get a reasonable weld fairly uh, fairly quickly. It's a dirty um, welding um, process though because it creates a slag which basically every time you weld you then have to chip this um, slag which is caused by the flux. It's basically the shielding that stops the weld oxidising and once it's cooled you have to um, chip that away. Um, but it's dirt cheap. Um, I bought that when I was at college and it had very, very, very little. I, I run a 1960s Land Rover um, when I was at college, so both, basically most of my money went on fuel. Um, and that is that was like the cheapest welder I could buy at the time. I think I can't remember whether it from B&Q or Machine Mart, but somewhere like that. Uh, and it was like 50 or 60 quid or something like that with, with uh, you know, some electrodes. A welding um, helmet, a really crappy paper weld welding helmet, but one nonetheless, and all the everything you needed to get yourself started. Um, so yeah, that, that's um, arc welding. We can move one step up from arc, and that's this machine here. Now this, it, they call it um, gasless MIG. Uh, I don't like calling it gasless MIG because MIG's metal inert gas. Um, I'd rather call it um, wire fed arc because that's basically what it is. Um, basically, you've got, well, I was sh showing it before, basically, you get a, um, a wire like this stuff and it's got a flux in the centre, so it's, rather than an um, arc welding electrode which has the flux on the outside and when you obviously as it melts it um, creates the um, shielding gas. Um, this has the flux on the inside, it's very much like um, the way solder is made. And 
what this basically does is it wire feeds it out the end of the. Um, let's just move my welding gauntlets. Um, let's grab the hand piece. You have your um, what's basically what's usually known, known as a swan neck or a goose neck. The um, handle itself and basically what it does is you've got a spool of that wire in there it feeds it through here out the end um, it works exactly the same way as all electrical welding you ground the piece of work that's why they have these big clamps on them so I should have explained that with arc how it actually works um, but these work exactly well they all three work exactly the same really um, basically what you do is you have an um, electrode that you ground onto your piece you're all the so you have an earth which you uh, connect to your piece. Your electrode, whether it be that or the wire coming out of the end of there, is at a, um, about 50 volts at a, quite a high current. And essentially what you're doing is you're creating an electrical arc at the end with a shielding gas around it which melts and uh, melts the metal together and um, you get a pool of metal forming which then makes you weld. Um, the only difference is, like I said, that is um, in a sticker, an electrode stick is where that's on a um, spool and it's fed through. This is, some people say it's easier to um, weld with this than with um, an arc welder. If you're working on very, very thin metal, like, you know, car bodywork style metal, um, you can actually do it with this, as well you can't really with the um, arc welder. It is a little bit more controllable if you've got wire speed. Um, power settings aren't as um, advanced on this as they are on that. That you've got a variable control for your power settings. This you've got a minimum and a maximum. But you do you can vary your um, wire speed on it. So this is actually the welder that we're going to be using for this project. Um, I would prefer to be using um, this here. Now this is a MIG welder. Um, that's. It's not the first MIG welder I um, owned. I bought, that's my second welder that I um, bought. I can't remember why I wanted, um, oh, it was, what was a welding? I had a Mini at the time, I had a Mini. And um, the arc welder wasn't really up to, um, it would just blow holes in Minis. Um, so I bought that to replace the um, sills and one of the eight panels on um, an old Mini that I had. Um, then a few years later I got my first MIG which was a, um, I think it was a Sealy brand, um, 130 amp turbo, same spec as um, the my current welder and I actually swapped uh, the remains of an old British Telecom Land Rover for it. I bought this old series uh, 3 long wheelbase XBT Land Rover um, off a farmer. It was completely knackered. Uh, I actually, I only wanted the um, gearbox and the um, big 750 tires that it had on it to go in mine. Anyway, I bought it. Uh, I bought it for 100 quid. Got it um, dragged back to mine. Took all the bits that I wanted off it and advertised it um, for what I paid for it. And a guy phoned me up and said he couldn't offer me any money for it, but would I be interested in swapping it for a welder? Um, a MIG welder, so I thought, oh, yeah, go on then. So anyway, I swapped it for this Sealy um, MIG welder, and it actually changed my life, because I've I learned to weld as well as I can now, which I'm not saying I'm a professional welder, I've got no welding qualifications at all, but I've glued quite a few things together with um, a welder, and none of them have fallen apart yet. So uh, I, I used that welder for years, until um, I was doing a favour for a mate um, welding up a car for him. This was on like a Sunday afternoon and um, we were turning the car around to do the other side and I ran over the um, gooseneck from a welder and destroyed it completely and uh, we had to get the job finished that day. Um, so at the time um, Aldi had these um, the, Powercraft um, branded uh, 130s in quite cheap, so I ran down to Aldi and bought one. And uh, I actually I sold my Sealy for um, on eBay for spares or repair, and got a fair got a fair chunk for it. Actually, um, I was quite surprised how much I actually um, got for it. It paid for like half this machine. 
And that that was well worn, that sealy. I mean, it was worn when I got it. Um, but yeah, um, basically, uh, this this is not a professional welder by any um, way, shape, or form. This is um, it's a switchable. It's a gas or no gas welder, so it will take the same um, gasless wire as my small um, Clark there. Or it'll take proper um, MIG welding wire, which you have to use with a uh, shielding gas. And that's basically the reason we're not using it at the moment, is I haven't got any gas. Um, I use um, CO2, just straight CO2 for welding. There's various different flavours of welding gas you can get. You can get... Um, you can use what I use, which is straight CO2, which is not what professional welders use. It's basically pub gas. It's what um, the pubs use to pump um, pump the uh, drinks up from the um, cellar. It's what they, they use to pressurise the uh, beer kegs and stuff like that. It's dirt cheap. I get a big um, canister, like, you know, quite a large size canister like that. Um, from a local supplier for, I think it cost me 18 quid for a refill. And that lasts me six months, sometimes even longer. I mean, pay like 30 quid uh, deposit on the bottle and when you bring the, take the empty back, it's just, just like 18 quid to refill it. That's the reason that I use pub gas for my welding. Um, you can get a CO2 argon mix which is what most, if you look at, see the small welding bottles that you buy, um, you know, from um, Machine Mart and stuff, places like that. Those are a CO2 argon mix, um, which is what, you know, proper well, you know, standard, like, mild steel welding gas is. Uh, it's mostly CO2 with a little bit of argon um, added to it. If you weld in more exotic metals like perhaps um, stainless steel and things like that, you have to use pure argon. Now pure argon is quite expensive, um, but for the welding that I do, um, pub gas is fine. I've never ever had a problem. I said I've welded, um, well, uh, I've been welding for over 20 years, um, so I've never ever, I've always used just pub gas. I even, I've even at one point used all CO2 fire extinguishers um, because I got a load of them for free. And they work. Uh, you, you have to be a bit careful with them because they have a tube inside them. You have to basically tip them upside down to use them as a, um, a, well, a gas source for welding. But um, they do work. Um, the other type of uh, electrical welding which I don't have is um, TIG. Um, TIG is TIG's a weird one. Um, it's it's very much like gas welding, um, where you have a filler rod and you have your TIG torch, and basically you strike an arc with the TIG torch, which is obviously you know um, I think it's hotter than the surface of the sun, and then you fe you feed a filler rod in, and um, that's how you create the weld. Um, I've never really played with TIG at all. Um, I would love to have a go at um, TIG welding because TIG you can work a lot, a lot more metals. You can work um, aluminium very. I mean, you can do aluminium and stainless with a MIG welder. Um, certain ones you can do with an arc welder with a cert with um, special rods and stuff like that. But um, a lot of these metals, they're a lot easier and you get a lot nicer weld on them if you use um, TIG. The problem with TIG is that you have to use pure argon. Um, pure argon is just too expensive for me. Uh, that's the main reason why I haven't even looked into it. Um, because you can pick up uh, used TIG sets fairly cheaply, but it's the cost of the argon which has basically put me off that. So I'm quite happy sticking with um, MIG and my pub gas, but the reason we're using, obviously we're using the gasless, is at the moment uh, the place I get my gas is uh, closed um, and I've run, I, I've run out, my, uh, my tank's empty. Um, I could swap this, because this is a better welder, this has got a higher current, um, this has got a 130 amp uh, maximum output on it, that one's only got an 85 amp uh, maximum output on it, but we're only welding 
one mil steel, perhaps one one point two mil steel or something like that. Um, that off, that's got plenty of um, guts in it to do that. That's not going to be a problem. As where we could set that one up to do it, but um, this is currently set up for Meg. You have to do quite a lot of messing around with this welder to set it up for the gasless wire. Um, there's a part inside the wire feed needs swapping over to the 0.8. This runs 0.6 um, solid core wire. That runs 0.8 flux cord wire. So um, to use this um, one, we'd have to swap the uh, wire feed over to 0.8. We'd have to swap the tip in the um, handpiece in the swan neck for a 0.8 tip, not a 0.6 tip. And we also have to swap the polarity over um, in the welder because um, I believe that one uses ne um, negative ground. Uh, no, sorry, that uses. Yeah, I think that one uses negative ground and that one uses positive ground. It's, uh, it's the other way around, but basically the, the opposite way around from one another. Both DC, but one uses a negative ground and one uses um, a positive ground. So for this project, we'll stick with um, El Cheapo. And if you want to get into this, you know, you don't want to have the cost of the um, CO2 bottles and um, the consumables and everything that this uses. Um, the wire is more expensive for this, but it's a much cheaper unit. I mean, these are under 100 quid. You can pick one of these up for um, with a starter set with a crappy mask and all the other um, bits. So if you want to get going... Um, I can't say I can really recommend. It's a toss up between um, what you get. Um, they are really cheap, the arc welders now, like 30 quid or something like that. I mean, if it's thicker stuff and you want to just have a go, get um, an arc welder for 30 quid. Um, if you want to work on thinner, um, thinner stuff, like car stuff, for, um, like the box section I'm working on with here, you know, just. Under a hundred quid, you can pick one of them up with the full um, full kit and caboodle and um, get started having a bit of fun. Well, I'm going to leave I'm going to leave this part of this here for now. So you've got kind of a basic overview of uh, what I'm doing with the um, project. Um, in the next part of this, we'll actually get to start cutting some steel and um, putting some bits together and what have you. So I um, hope you enjoyed that this little introduction to this um, this project that's going on. So. Uh, Thanks for watching and goodbye.